Beginning in 1949, the American and British governments engaged in a clandestine attempt to overthrow the socialist pro-Soviet regime of Enver Hoxha through guerrilla-fomented uprisings. The choice had fallen upon Albania because it was regarded as the most vulnerable of the socialist states, the smallest and the weakest, not sharing a border with the Soviet Union. Isolated between a US-controlled Greece and a Yugoslavia that was a renegade from the Soviet bloc. Moreover, a recent agreement between the Soviet Union and Albania involved aid for Albania in return for a Soviet right to build a submarine base with direct access to the Mediterranean. By the rules and logic of the Cold War board game, this is a move the United States was obliged to thwart. Thus, a task force composed of the CIA and the British Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS, began planning the Albanian operation. The task force began by recruiting scattered Albanian emigres who were living in Italy, Greece, and elsewhere. They were exposed to basic military training with a touch of guerrilla warfare thrown in at sites established on the British island of Malta and the Mediterranean, in the American occupation zone of West Germany, and to a lesser extent, in England itself. Whenever we want to subvert any place, confided Frank Wisner, the CIA's head of covert operations, we find that the British own an island within easy reach. Intermittently, for some three and a half years, the emigres were sent back into their homeland, slipping up into the mountains of Greece and over the border, parachuting in from planes which had taken off from bases in Western Europe, entering by sea from Italy, American planes and balloons dropped propaganda leaflets and goods as well, such items in scarce supply in Albania as flour, halva, needles, and razor blades, along with a note announcing they were a gift from the Albanian National Liberation Front. Another instance of the subtle marketing touch that the CIA, born and raised in America, was to bring to so many of its operations. In outline, the plan, or the hope, was for the guerrillas to make for their old home regions and try to stir up anti-Soviet, anti-communist sentiments, eventually leading to uprisings. They were to distribute propaganda, obtain political, economic, and military information, engage in sabotage, recruit individuals into cells, and supply them with equipment. Later infusions of men and material would expand these cells into centers of resistance. Cold War conventional wisdom dictated that the masses of Eastern Europe were waiting to be sparked into open rebellion for their freedom. Even if this were the case, the choice of ignition was highly dubious, for the guerrillas included amongst their numbers many who supported a reinstitution of the Albanian monarchy in the person of the reactionary King Zong, then in exile, and others who had collaborated with the Italian fascists or Nazis during their wartime occupations of Albania. To be sure, there were those of Republican and Democratic leanings in the various immigre committees as well, but State Department papers, later declassified, revealed that prominent Albanian collaborators played leading roles in the formation of these committees. These were individuals the State Department characterized as having somewhat checkered political backgrounds who quote, might sooner or later occasion embarrassment to this government, unquote. They were admitted to the United Nations over the department's objections because of intelligence considerations. One of the checkered gentlemen was Zafer Deva, Minister of Interior during the Italian occupation, who had been responsible for deportations of Jews, communists, partisans, and suspicious persons, as a captured Nazi report put it, to extermination camps in Poland. In the name of the CIA-funded National Committee for a Free Albania, a powerful underground radio station began broadcasting inside the country, calling for the nation's liberation from the Soviet Union. In early 1951, several reports came out of Albania of open organized resistance and uprisings. To what extent these happenings were a consequence of the Western infiltration and agitation is impossible to exactly determine. Overall, the campaign had little to show for its efforts. It was hounded throughout by logistical fallops and the grim reality that the masses of Albanians greeted the immigrants as something less than liberators. Worst of all, the Albanian authorities usually seemed to know in which area the guerrillas would be arriving and where. This was because of Soviet-aligned double agents and infiltrators. So lax was security in Albania that the New York Times correspondent Cyrus L. Sulzberger filed several dispatches from the Mediterranean area touching upon the intervention, which required virtually no reading between the lines. The articles carried no attention-grabbing headlines, there was no public comment on them from Washington, no reporters asked government officials any 
embarrassing questions. It was a non-event for Americans. Although the operation was not hugely successful, the action did hold the danger of escalating into conflict with the Soviet Union. The Soviets did in fact send some new fighter planes to Albania, presumably in the hope that they could shoot down the foreign aircraft making drops. The operation could not fail to remind Stalin, Hosha, and the entire socialist bloc of another Western intervention 30 years earlier in the Soviet Union. It could only serve to make them yet more paranoid about Western intentions and convince them to turn the screw of internal security up yet another notch. Indeed, every now and again over the ensuing years, Hosha mentioned the American and British quote-unquote invasion and used it to justify his policy of isolation. In the early 1960s, however, Hosha himself did what the CIA and SIS had failed to do. He pulled Albania out of the Soviet orbit. The Albanian leader purged pro-Soviet officials in his government and aligned his country with China. There was no significant military retaliation on the part of the USSR. In the mid-1970s, Hosha forsook China as well, but that's a story for another time. This video is based on and quotes at length from the essential book Killing Hope by William Blum. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider leaving a small tip on PayPal or supporting me on Patreon if you'd like to see a lot more content like this and you wouldn't mind helping me pay bills or eat. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow on Twitter, and have a better day than yesterday.